round two of our interviews of our superintendent finalists. Uh, tonight, uh, we will have Mr. Corey McIntyre, and we will start off uh, with the introductions. Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce you to finalist Corey McIntyre, who is currently associate superintendent for the Anoka Hennepin School District. Corey, thank you. Good evening. Um, <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. You had a good dinner? Yes, it was great. It's been a great day. Good, yeah, good. I uh, wanted to go over what the ground rules are going to be tonight. Um, and we have an hour. We have 11 questions, a little bit better than the last time, so uh, you don't have to run through uh, them as quick. But there will be follow-up by uh, yeah. follow-up potential from the board members. And at the end, you will have time for a statement. Great. So uh, we, will, we will go from there. So uh, okay. hopefully, uh, well, I'll kick things off and uh, start with please begin by very briefly highlighting your professional experiences and how they have prepared you to be the superintendent in Osseo area schools. All right, well, thank you again for the opportunity to be with you tonight. I'm excited to, to um, hear, hear your questions and tell you more about myself. And um, I know earlier today, we had a chance to hear more about my story. Um, and for you, you know, th th my professional experience, you know, it really intertwines with my personal experience and what I'm all about and why I do this work. So, you know, you heard a little bit about um, some of the adversity that I've experienced in life and why that makes me want to do this work and why I get up and try to help students every day and make sure that we give them everything they need. So that journey has been a long one for me in, in the sense that um, it's been developmental where um, I wasn't planning on being a superintendent candidate. I wasn't probably planning on being an administrator in a school system, but that's where my path has taken me based on my passion to, to work with, uh, with students and support families and students in their learning. Um, professionally, the, you know, to your question, you know, my, my professional experience started as a school psychologist in the state of Washington. Actually, I had one year in Minnesota before we moved um, out west. Um, you know, my wife's a school psychologist, and we joke about that because, you know, um, the two of us together make quite a pair, and, you know, um, we wonder what our pets are going to turn out to be like <laughs> with that. Um, that gave me uh, the launching pad. I had some amazing mentors that pushed me into considering administration, and you you know, I, I point out that sometimes, um, just like our students, people see things in us that, you know, we don't see ourselves. And um, that little nudge helped me just launch into the, the world of um, special education and being an administrator of that area along with some student services work. And I had great um, experiences in a very diverse dist or two districts in, in the state of Washington right outside of Seattle. Um, and we're... I grew immensely professionally from my own cultural lens, my own um, equity lens, um, being in, in that area. And we made a decision at that point to move back to, the, to Minnesota and take advantage of the opportunities uh, th that we had in front of us where, where, we, where I landed in uh, Rochester Public Schools as the Director of Student Services and worked there for four years um, before taking uh, advantage of an opportunity in Hudson, Wisconsin as the director of student services there. And um, that was a little broader role, we added on some additional departmental responsibilities, and that was a really good advancement opportunity for me at that point in my career. Um, from there, I moved into the North St. Paul area schools, uh, that's North St. Paul Maplewood Oakdale schools, and um, had some amazing experiences there to develop my leadership skills around um, managing and leading through some really challenging issues um, to how to support kids and then also uh, with the district going through an $8 million budget cut. And we had gone through that similar experience of about $9 million when I was in Rochester. So it really forces you to, as a system, engage with staff and uh, the community on what's important when you make kind of reductions like that and prioritize what's important for student learning. And so those are very rich experiences for me as I developed um, in, in my own uh, growth as a leader. Um, from there, I moved to a uh, position in Anoka Hennepin Schools the last three years and starting with um, really helping uh, build on some work done district-wide, specifically in the area of special education, where we embarked on a, a very large analysis and audit of the special education program 
and I led the work of making some significant changes around uh, how we support students and staff at the sites and, and being aligned to best practice and making sure we're doing our best to meet needs of students while at the same time supporting families and students and our, and our schools with, um, with better programming. Um, while, so my experience in Anoka Hennepin, just to expand on that, we, you know, I've had uh, the opportunity to help lead the work around um, helping pass a large levy, largest in the state, and doing some boundary work, uh, specifically moving boundaries of 20 schools um, due to growth happening in the district. And um, that's a good reason to, to do boundary changes, but it's still hard, it's still painful. Um, it, it really is challenging for students and families and staff. And so a lot of valuable lessons learned through that process on uh, how, to, how to do that effectively and transparently and making sure the community had lots of voice in the decision making around the options as, as those decisions were finally made by the school board. Um, so that work's still going on and um, I'll just add that you know my work in supporting the middle school level, I supervise all the uh, principals at the middle school level, you know, about 9,000 students at six middle schools, and the work that gets done at the middle level in addition to supporting the K-12 work that I'm supporting in the other departments I'm responsible for. So I feel like I've had you know a range of experience, m small, medium, and large districts in three states. I know that doesn't always sound great, but I, um, those were all due to really good growth opportunities for me professionally and, and really personally that was best for my family and um, making sure that we're doing the best for my, for my, my children and my, my partner, my wife, and her role as well as an educator. So those were very intentional decisions and um, very planful ones, and that's what leads me here. Um, I'm choosing to be wanting to be a part of this system and lead this district because I believe there's a lot of really important work that matches my skill set and my passion for the work that needs to be done moving forward and I'm excited about the foundation that's been laid up to this point in the district. Lots of amazing things to build on and I saw a lot of that this today meeting with staff and students. Um, it was just an amazing day of, of learning for me and sharing about what I would bring to the table as far as the superintendent position goes. So. Thank you for giving me a moment to explain my story a little bit. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. In your work to close the achievement gap, what specific strategies have you used and what have been the specific outcomes? Sure. Well, let me start with, um, this reminds me just of a few things that I've been a part of leading um, most recently in my last district, and I'll think of, uh, I'll add some things from a, a couple other districts, but most recently in Anoka Hennepin. I've helped lead some efforts uh, around curriculum adoptions and making sure we have high core instruction happening, strong core instruction in reading and math. So the district has um, implemented a new reading adoption here in the last three years at the elementary level and, and piloting math adoption materials at the, at the elementary level as well. We are in the process of going through a secondary math adoption for middle schools and high schools. And the reason I bring that up is to your point in closing the achievement gap, you have to have high quality instruction at the, in the core classes in those core instructional content areas. So reading, math, and I'll add in, we've just launched a curriculum adoption process for social emotional learning. And when you think of a strong curriculum process, you have strong core, you have um, intervention that helps move students who are high performing forward, and you also help students who are struggling move forward as well with intervention. and that. That multi-tiered multi system of support is critical in closing the achievement gap. Um, you heard a little bit earlier tonight about family engagement. So I've led some efforts in my recent district here around um, targeting some specific efforts in some buildings that we know we had specific um, student group gaps, uh, specifically working with our uh, um, Spanish-speaking families and really engaging them in a more authentic manner, bringing them to the table and giving us feedback on what we can do better to improve student achievement. And I just believe, and you've, you know, the research would, would support the fact that family engagement is a key factor in closing the achievement gap because we need engagement from every sector of our district and really strive for all families. So that's another example. And then I would just add, um, in other districts I've been in, and so for example, in North St. Paul, you know, that was an, another district where we put in a, a tiered system of support to really make sure we're intervening when students need strong intervention 
and also when students are high achieving and putting some structures and systems in place to make sure that we are moving all, all students forward. I'll just add lastly that I think the critical piece around um, equity work and making sure that we are really building strong connections with students and families from an engagement standpoint. We have a shot at closing the achievement gap if we can make sure students are engaged. So uh, we've had specific efforts and you know, one example is making sure we give student voice uh, through their educational process. I meet with students regularly with other team members, making sure we get meaningful feedback from our students so they give us um, honest uh, ideas about what we can do to help support them. So when we have students engaged and their parents engaged, with our other efforts, that's when we can really begin to close more aggressively and faster the achievement gaps. And you, you asked about results, and our results in Anoka Hennepin have, we've had, yes, we have gaps, but those gaps have been some of the smaller gaps when you compare us to our uh, other metro districts across the metro. And so I, I would say that our results, we, we are getting results from those efforts, and that, you know, we're not satisfied though, we're not done, and we gotta keep, keep pushing forward with that. Thank you. Could you just expand a little bit more? Um, in your Q&A session, you talked a little bit about um, special education and the disproportionality between a specifically male students of color and their achievement gap. Could you just expand on that a little yeah, bit more, please? I'd love to. Thanks for asking about that. That's a really challenging area. You heard me talk about it earlier. So specifically, uh, and it's not unique to Anoka Hennepin or other, I mean, I've seen it uh, be true in other districts I've been a part of. There's a tendency for some overrepresentation of students of color, specifically African American students in the areas of developmental cognitive delay and also um, 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 a couple other disability areas, especially uh, emotional behavioral disorders. So I would also add, you know, we have some other disparities in with our uh, Hispanic families in the area of specific learning disability. So that's an issue we all have to tackle and how we get there is aligning ourselves so the solutions to that are making sure we are identifying best research-based practices in each of those disability areas and what's um, the best service delivery models for that and giving teachers strategies and training on how to um, meet those demands and uh, those gaps are coming from um, some disability specific reasons. So instructionally, what do we do differently? And how do we provide them with that professional development? And then we also look at how is our identification process working for us? And are we putting in place interventions on the front end, preventing students from needing to receive special education services? So um, I'll always add to students who have disabilities, we support them and we love to um, meet their needs when we can um, without the need of that service if we can have them be as, as um, successful as possible in the general ed curriculum. So there needs to be a real thoughtful, intentional plan and with strategies and measures on how we're closing those gaps that we, we've identified. And that's unique to each district, but that's just some examples of how we've targeted. This year we have the first year of a four-year plan and there's 40 action steps designed to to address those disparities, and um, we'll evaluate it, you know, at the end of the year whether we hit our targets on that, and reevaluate, you know, go from there, re readjust our plan if needed. So, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, some of your previous interviews or times speaking to us, you mentioned the idea of a unified school district community. What does that mean to you, and how will you attain it in Osseo? Yeah. Well, this reminds me of a couple other experiences that I have. So um, when you serve multiple communities, those communities all have different identities and they all have different needs and we celebrate those, right? But the challenge there is how do you have all those communities with their own individual identities and needs and strengths and weaknesses come together as one district? And I think that is the job of the superintendent working with the school board is we are the Osseo School District and um, I had some amazing questions from students today about are there differences in the different schools? Are there different needs not being met in different, in different buildings? And we need to work together towards we are one district and coming together as, as a whole instead of feeling like there's different factions of the district that um, don't feel part of that one system. Now with that, 
different buildings have different needs. So how do we meet those unique needs that are unique to those schools and still have this culture of we're one school district. We're all in this together. And I think that the, um, that's where my strengths come in as a relational leader. That's just my style. Um, I, my, I get my work done through connecting with people and building synergy and building commitment and belief in the work that needs to be done. And I, I'm excited about the opportunity to continue to build towards that feeling of one district. You know, I'm in a large district now. It's a challenge when you have multiple communities and trying to be, uh, um, have um, the feeling of one, um, one connected uh, school district. And I've experienced that even you know, when I was in Rochester, there was three high schools. When I was in North St. Paul, there was two high schools. And sometimes they have their, they have their own identities, but they're also part of the same common district, the same mission, same vision, same strategic priorities. Um, and I'm, I'm, I've, I believe it can be done, and I know that this uh, school board and, and the district has worked hard at this, so I'm excited to build on those efforts to continue to build towards this, this common culture of we're one Osseo area schools. One follow-up to that. Um, so what are some specific strategies that you've seen be successful in accomplishing that or employed yeah. yourself? Yeah, so um, just recently one example is, um, well, it, uh, let me start with a transparency and really strong communication. And you, you need to be uh, moving messages out that this is helping um, and supporting the entire system. But the way we get that done is through, uh, when I work with the principals of my schools that I support, when I'm, it's very transparent. What we're doing in one school is made very well aware to the other building so that um, you don't begin to have these, uh, well, you get one thing, but I get another, and I don't understand why that is. And then it gets to be a little, Territorial, so we do that with full transparency together, right? So everyone understands why you might do this specific support for one school but not others, and acknowledging what their needs are. When every school has a sense or every leader has a sense for what each other's needs are, they coalesce and they gel. So um, how we provide supports or resources. Um, um, so, for example, schools that we maybe have in the Coon Rapids area needs a different level of, of intervention or support for the needs of the students in the building, and that might be different than um, another building on the other side of town, like a Roosevelt a Middle School. So their needs are different, and how do we kind of have this balance of be giving what every, you know, each building needs, whether it's staffing, whether it's support, whether it's training, uh, staff development, um, because we really use our test results to drive what it is we should be intervening with and, and providing support with. So um, I'll give you an example where this year at Jackson Middle School, we, we weren't happy with our science results. So we made some really, um, uh, we really dug into that data to understand why that is. This is a specialty school, this is their, this is their thing. They took it personally, the staff really owned it and I love that. They wanted to, how do we turn this around and do 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 better, and what do we? What do I do to support them in those efforts? And so it can be very targeted, um, based on performance information. So that's a, one example. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, a follow up again. <coughs> so I understand what you said. It's a you know looking at performance, but you know I think in our district in particular, that's not always where the divide is. It's around race. Sure. Um, in our big in our district. And so that really does speak to the relationship piece and being able to bridge that gap. So do you have an example of that in your current role or any of your roles around some issues that aren't necessarily based on performance or yeah. those kind of measurements, but just just culturally as a district the, the, that it is, um, that's like a really discerning kind of factor in some yeah. of the divide? Well, the, the first thing I think of when I, when I you know, hear you speak about that is I, a specific example at one of the middle schools where we you know, had s uh, students very frustrated with how they were perceiving how different um, student groups were being uh, treated around discipline. And um, that was from the student level really frustrating. So we worked really hard to give them time and space to share their voice around um, a couple specific discipline in instances. and process through and get student voice on what are some proactive solutions to um, go in, the, in a positive direction. So the students formed together and created students sta uh, tall against, stand tall against racism and they're presenting 
uh, lessons to other students at the middle school level and the power of student to student um, collaboration and instruction was very powerful in that one instance at a school level. At a district level, we, got, you know, we have to make sure we are um, providing um, staff development that's really, really getting at the core causes of, of those concerns. So whether it's working through um, culturally responsive teaching practices, we have a strong culturally responsive teaching model in uh, Anoka and making sure we're, we're one small example is um, we did training on the power of names. Just making sure our staff were pronouncing and speaking students' names correctly because we learned that if that's not happening, kids shut down and they are not engaged. So it sounds kind of simple, but it was a big um, step forward in dishonoring and acknowledging cultural differences and our names all mean something very important to all of us, right? So that's just one example. We did that across the system just to make sure we hit, we've lifted up all of our staff around that particular topic this year. Thank you. Yeah. What are the key components of a successful curriculum and instruction program in a district, and how do you get each school involved in that effort? Thank you. I'm going to come back to, um, so this makes me think of a time where uh, we realized we didn't have a strong system of support in place. You heard me talk about core curriculum, and I think the, the curriculum model needs to have strong fidelity to core instruction, high quality first best instruction, and then how do we support students who need an additional dose of support, whether they're struggling or whether they're advancing and they're learning faster than um, other students and having strategic and intensive support. So an example of, of what we did in Anoka the last couple of years is actually built a common framework for our multi-tiered systems of support so that we had uh, common language and then when we needed to look at uh, those intervention strategies we we were targeted in our efforts so we added you know we've we've um, added reading interventions at the elementary and middle school level specific programs for that we've at we are studying our math intervention model at the middle school level and the other big step that I think we've taken that I believe is important is, um, I'll speak to the secondary level with the, where my work is primarily embedding the culturally responsive teaching into every content area. So we basically got 14 different content areas when you think about all the different areas of instruction at the secondary level and embedding that work into each of the um, collaborative teams and all of the common summative assessment works, how we assess students and in those collaborative teams, how teachers are delivering content and having that culturally responsive lens. Another piece that we've done recently from a curriculum instruction lens is you know, the coaching we provide teachers through our QCOMP program. Um, they've been studying the work of Yvette Jackson and um, culturally responsive teaching when it comes to academic improvement or academic achievement. And so they've been studying that work and embedding that in their coaching of, of staff as we continue to you know, build capacity with instructional practice. So it's, a, it's about embedding it uh, more than it is, you know, we've learned that you can't, it's harder to do, pull them out, give a, ses a professional development session and hope that it goes back into the classroom, but give real time job embedded support to teachers in the classrooms in the moment. And that we're, we believe that'll move the needle faster on our, our achievement gap work. So I kind of, you know, you asked about curriculum, but I added in the equity piece because I think it's just so critical. And, you know, students need to see themselves in our curriculum. All of our students and all of our cultures need to see themselves in not only our curriculum, but our, our staff, our teaching staff. And continuing to embed that work in a thoughtful, planful manner, right? Intentional, and then also being able to evaluate and measure that thoughtfully as well. Um, so that we can be successful and sustain it and make it sustainable. Okay. What have you done in your district to promote E12 education and the importance of early childhood education? Uh, well, the early childhood work has been amazingly challenging the last few years for good reasons. We are all growing rapidly in our um, we're really successful at uh, inter finding more students to intervene with and uh, support through our preschool programming and our intervention efforts. And that's 
challenged us from a facilities and a staffing standpoint. And we just know that when we intervene early, we, we likely get students on track sooner and we don't need as long or sustained intervention you know, down the road. So investing in um, quality instructional practices and strong uh, collaboration teaming. We know uh, one example is just the um, building inclusive practices with um, serving students with disabilities with our uh, other preschool programs through family education and doing that jointly um, in, in their natural environments with their typical peers. Um, we also know that um, we need, we've had real uh, high success with the pre-literacy and pre-math skills in the early childhood um, arena as we prepare them for kindergarten. So our fall to spring data shows tremendous growth um, in their pre-math and pre-literacy skills um, through our, our TS Gold data and really trying to get students ready for, for kindergarten. Can you give, sorry, just a follow up here. Can you give um, specifically what you've done to promote maybe to families within the district? Um, how, are, how is Anoka Hennepin specifically promoting or campaigning for? In the area of early childhood? Yeah. 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 Well, you've heard from me earlier tonight, my strong compassion for family engagement. And um, there's really a big opportunity in the early childhood arena because families are, you know, in those early ages are just, they're just so invested in wanting the, you know, to do the right thing um, when they're young. And, and that starts at the birth to three program that we, we serve students through in our special education world. And that is um, probably the most um, best or the best example of, you know, the services we provide for birth to three are done in the home where families are comfortable, where they um, are in their natural environment and we can give them strategies to, to use um, to improve their child's learning. And then as we move into the three to five year old range, you know, the idea is the more we can partner with families specifically, and again, I just keep coming back to we go to them. We just have to go to our families and, and provide support where they're most comfortable and can be most successful. So that's a lot of outreach and a lot of tools and um, <coughs> there's some examples, you know, I gave earlier tonight about, you know, if we sense that um, there's specific buildings that need support, you know, we, there's the example of providing a, um, Spanish-speaking cultural liaison for some buildings uh, and engaging them in the work at their home and their community, getting feedback from them on what do they need from us, and then also some strategies and tools and using some um, research-based cur curriculum to do that, you know, that best legacy program that I referred to earlier tonight. So that's one example. Great, yeah. thank you. How have you balanced the set of priorities and expectations for teachers to ensure focus and time is spent on the most critical priorities in day-to-day -day instruction? Oh, creating time, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> well, um, my, my first approach on that is really making sure I'm in tune with the teachers. What is their reality? What, what are they experiencing? And the best way for me to do that is to be out in the buildings and just checking in with them, kind of informally, because you just get a lot of more honesty um, and feedback when it's it's safe and it's in their classroom and it's um, their truth. Um, then we work through uh, strategies to make sure we're we're maximizing they have the time they have with kids and not putting too many uh, additional responsibilities. And I can add one example here: when we adopted our elementary reading uh, curriculum, um, we learned along the way that it was. Um, the demands it placed on teachers for assessment. It was really heavy and the teachers kept telling us, I don't have enough time for instruction and I'm assessing things I maybe haven't been able to teach. So um, while still trying to maintain fidelity to the program, adjusting the how much time is spent in assessment and the types of things we're assessing. So really being smart about data, because you've heard me talk before, data is just data until you make it into information and information is what's usable to make change. So it's an example of listening to our staff and they're saying we need more time with students in instruction. We're doing the same kind of work with um, in the special ed arena where we have teachers spending about half their time with, with do, uh, paperwork challenges and, and we want teachers with students. So a lot of it is just listening to ideas from our staff and how we put into some of those practices across the system. 
um, because the demands keep expanding and how do we give them efficient, uh, you know, in the, in the world of immediate responses with social media and just, a, you know, we all feel like we gotta be available all the time, um, working through how to maintain strong connections, but are we focused on the right things and that is, is the direct time with students. Um, and making sure that also teachers have adequate time for preparation so that they're prepared to, prepared to be strong instructors. So we really um, collaborative uh, teams or time with uh, grade level teams to prepare and get on the same page with instruction and, and quality assessments too. So efficiencies matter right now with the climate we're in on maximizing instructional time and being as efficient we can with the assessments so that they actually inform instruction and we use that data to, to drive changes to how we teach. So a couple examples. Thank you. Following up to that, have you ever had an instance where you had to delay an initiative or say no to an initiative to ensure that you were prioritizing effectively? Absolutely, and I think that's uh, the work of the school board is to help give us some direction on, you know, we bring information to you and help us make some decisions. So um, one example is, you know, you heard me talk about rolling out a reading um, core curriculum and piloting math core curriculum while we're doing boundary changes, while we're doing facility additions, while we're moving 5,000 students around in the district. So we've been very intentional about um, pacing and timing of taking on new initiatives. And, the, and I, I believe it's the superintendent's job to help inform you about here's the work that's in front of our staff and give, helping you make the best decisions about staying focused on our priorities. What are the key things we should be focusing on that you've committed to fund? And then making sure that you know we've, we do that work well. So um, an example I can use right now is you know, uh, our, we were gonna make a decision on a math intervention model at the middle school level. And we didn't have compelling data for any of the three models. They were all making a difference, but one really didn't stand out. And so we're delaying that decision until we get spring assessment data on MAP and MCA and our common summative assessments to see if that informs us any more about um, if one of the models is more the better choice or is it really all three work if you do it with fidelity, they all have their own merits and, and let the buildings decide which one works for them as long as they do it with fidelity. So that's a decision that you know we've been thoughtful about. Another example would be um, our secondary math curriculum adoption went through a, a year-long process, tried to narrow it, we had it down to two sets of materials, and neither one of them really stood out as a clear-cut winner. So we held off on that decision, the board held off on that decision so we could continue to evaluate and let teachers pilot. So those that <coughs> wanted to pilot those materials continue to collect data to see if, if with more time, uh, you know, teachers wanted more time with it as well. Um, does that begin to clarify itself? But being clear with you as board members, here's our benchmarks. We come back and give you updates on a regular basis so you know exactly where we're at in a process like that. So you, you gotta, you know, if there wasn't uniform buy-in uh, from our staff on, a, on one of those models and they were kind of split, we're not gonna force that decision until we have really clear evidence that one is the right choice. Because we're talking about a big investment and you hear me talk about return on investment making sure that we're, we're maximizing our resources. Thank okay. you. Uh, next question. <clears throat> uh, how do you communicate to your staff, students, and community members in your current district? What different strategies and actual tools do you use? And please share an example of a time when you have successfully used those strategies. Sure. I keep thinking of this boundary change process. That's, a, that's just a, a regular communication. Um, um, weekly communication effort, primarily through our principals in that, in that instance, because uh, our building leaders know their staff the best. And uh, I work with them about, around messaging and what's the updates on the, on the process. And I rely on the building leaders to um, go back and have those conversations because they have the relationships with the, the staff and they have the trust built with the staff. Now in a couple cases, when there's questions from the district level, then I go out and I support the principals with additional information and what would be helpful from the district level. 
Um, but that's just one example of frequent, I mean, almost over communication about updates on where we're at with the process. The other example is when we went through our large special education audit. That was a pre-K 21 effort. We did 15 audits over a year and a half. And you know that, that was um, a combination of in-person, uh, I mean, I was trying to be in, his front, in front of as many staff groups as possible for that whole year just to give updates. Um, that's one way of communicating. We did regular board presentations so that our community was aware of the progress we were making on that, on that audit. And then also just frequent, um, you, know, you can use uh, email for some of those lower level kind of process um, pieces and timelines so people have record of that and they can refer back to it. So sometimes it's good to have it in writing. Um, I just, I'm a strong believer in, you know, just you can't, o you, you can't over communicate. You gotta repeat the message and sometimes someone will feel like they've heard you say it 10 times and others will feel like they've been hearing it for the first time because they had just a lot of things going on in their life. So um, consistent, frequent, repeated messaging and my preference is to do those things in person whenever I can but also lean and rely on our building leaders because they are, they are the leaders of their schools in um, working on messaging uh, know when it comes to big initiatives like that or even just small day-to-day -day pieces one of the best ways that I, I prefer to communicate is I'm just out preemptively out there in schools twice a week being visible available asking questions um, be, um, teachers like to know you're in the building and familiar or aware of what the work is that they're working on you know in the building so and it keeps me grounded on what's happening All right. thank you mm -hmm. Please describe for us what you consider to be the key components of the best learning environment for students. Mm. Well, here are the three things I, th I think matter the most. Um, they have to have the, 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 the adult in the room, the teacher in the room, has to have a relationship with their students and be engaging. Um, there's got to be a level of trust and in, in, in you know, that teacher sets the tone on a safe, welcoming environment in that classroom. That, to me, is number one. Um, number two, have we given that teacher the tools they need to deliver the content in the best way they can? Um, whether that's technology, whether that's other materials, you know, what are the tools they need to be effective in delivering that? And then I think of the environment itself as number three. Have we structured you know, I think of flexible learning environments that we've talked about before. You know, in some um, spaces, we need the ability to have students work together in collaborative groups. And have we set up the environment to, to allow that to happen? Um, can they sit face to face in small groups and work together versus out sitting in the hall on the floor, which is a barrier sometimes. So um, structuring the room in the environment so that it is conducive to interaction and engagement amongst each other. So there's that student to student piece that's effective. So high strong teacher and um, you know, trust and engagement relation pieces, the strong uh, tools for the, the content and the material and then just the physical space itself. And that's challenging. Some of us, you know, I know we have space challenges and we're getting very creative with where we teach. And um, that's a reality that we're all trying to address and I've seen teachers do amazing things in some pretty amazing <laughs> places that you wouldn't think are really good learning environments but really great teachers find ways to connect with kids even if it's not the perfect um, classroom environment so thank you so Corey if you could bring any new program or innovation to Osseo with no restrictions what would you call on the board to research and fund? No restrictions? <laughs> no, this is the dream time. Let's dream together. Oh, um, only one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, boy, that's, um, I've never given that, that wish list kind of dream scenario. That's good. Um, so, so for me, I find myself, you know, when I think of, well, that could be a curricular piece, that could be something more technical when it comes to instruction, but you know, what I think makes the biggest difference, you've heard me talk about this, is the connectedness amongst uh, teachers and students. So, 
you know, if it's no restrictions, it's you know, what kind of supports and training and professional development can we provide our staff to feel really strong in this skill set piece around how to connect best with students. And I also, you know, so when you talk about social emotional learning, when you talk about um, students treating other students well, efforts around, you know, I just keep thinking safe and welcoming environments. When we have that and when that can include uh, efforts around uh, around equity and cultural responsive teaching and and just differences now we've broken down a lot of barriers and we can really get to the heart of of ramping up effective learning right so I kind of go towards those relational pieces some of those social pieces that are that can be such big barriers for us we may we may have the most strong uh, you know amazing math or reading program but if we don't have some of those foundational relational pieces and safe and welcoming environments in place, the most amazing math curriculum won't get us there. So if, if that was the dream, you know, that, that's my um, student services background probably coming through. But again, when, when there's strong connections in our, with our adults and students, then amazing things happen. I'm gonna add a follow-up. Um, Tonight you talked a lot about student voice, so kind of in this vein of if there was something that you could bring, um, what about those experiences and student leadership and student voice would you wanna see implemented here? Yeah, and I haven't had time to figure out if that's already happening here sure, or not, yeah. I, um, but that has been very powerful. And especially at times now where we seem to have lots of division happening, um, student voice and the abilities for students to, to bring issues forward to the building level administration or even at the district level and provide some structure and constructive ways to move forward with those issues. Um, that has been super powerful. So absolutely I would want to know, are we um, doing those things here? What student-led activities or what student-led voice um, components are in place? And you've heard me talk about a couple different student-led efforts um, I would want to know more about that because uh, I feel like when we went through a time where there was some walkouts and other things, I, I worried that that was lost energy and lost effort because, well, you know, students were so passionate about that, and we want that voice and how we most constructively channel that to change and how we create change with that, and that not being lost. And that's challenging, you know, I, I don't know if I have that completely sorted out, but when you can give a platform a, in a safe, meaningful way where people are listening and receptive to it, now we got a shot, now we got a chance. Um, if it's not done effectively, then people's barriers and walls go up and, and the listening doesn't happen and then it, then it becomes some, some um, harder issues to break through. So Thank I you. would love to bring that piece to the table, yeah. Thank you. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, do you have experience uh, with students being part of like a non-voting member of the board or any kind of student district level board? Yeah, when I was in North St. Paul, every high school had a student rep uh, as a part of the board and they would come to the beginning of the meetings and give updates um, for all the board members on activities that was going on there and also some input on any of the issues that the buildings were experiencing as a direct feedback loop to the board. Um, that was highly valued uh, by the board members in that district. That's, that's the one example I can think of where there were student board members. I've been on um, suburban Ramsey County uh, collaborative, family collaborative also had student membership on the board there. And that was a new thing in the last two years, I think. So th there's, there is some evidence out there to really promote um, student voice on, on boards, you know, and decide, you know, boards that make decisions and having that perspective. You can flip it too. Board members join us in student meetings mm -hmm. at the high schools and middle schools. So when we go out to the high schools and we go to the middle schools and we meet with 20 to 30 students at a time, board members join us and get to hear the real direct, honest, real feedback from the student level <coughs> on a variety of topics. And you know, when our board members can hear directly from hundreds of students a year. It just gives you a whole other lens on, on decision making. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So you currently have responsibility for um, several middle schools uh, and developmental areas in your current work, um, depart sorry, department areas in your current work. What have your buildings achieved under your leadership um, and what achievements are you most proud of? There's lots, lots of things I'm proud of. Um, I believe, well, I'll start with, you know, you've heard a lot about the, this uh, special education audit. I really think we're getting some really solid traction on improvements in the student performance and higher um, outcomes, behavioral and academic outcomes, positive behavioral outcomes and academic outcomes from our special ed department. At the, um, um, I also think we're doing the same with our English learners uh, department as well with some restructuring on uh, how we staff the program and how we provide service delivery to students in their learning with such a wide range of needs um, in front of us. We are also studying, I got lots of examples in this one. We got, um, we're studying the impact of our mental health therapy uh, offerings. We have a therapist in every building, so we're talking medical, clinical, mental health therapists in every school. <coughs> What's the impact on achievement? So we're studying, are we seeing um, stronger academic outcomes, but are, are we seeing better attendance? Are we seeing fewer discipline referrals? We're studying all those things to really make a, a straight line correlation or at least you know, some relationship between the, imp the impact of that service and, and student outcomes. And it might be as simple as students are coming to school more. They mm -hmm. can access school more. It might be as simple as that or you know, we're really pushing the academic outcome piece. Um, the middle school level has seen six years straight of reading growth. We're one of a handful of districts in the whole metro that has seen six consecutive years of increased reading scores. We're proud of that work and um, you know I've been there for three of those years so I'm not going to take credit for all six as much as I'd like okay. to but I can't. Um, we're also you know what I'm proud of is when we're not seeing results we dig into that. We t unpack it. We figure out what can we do differently and I love when our staff lean into that and go, we, we can do better. What is it we're missing? You know, and even at a teacher to teacher level, what is it something you're doing in your classroom that I need to learn from you to do better myself? And creating those safe spaces for those collaborative uh, conversations around instruction. Data drives that, right? Um, so those are a couple of examples of, um, you know, I'll, I'll just throw in one more there. I, I, we've seen, uh, strong growth in our early childhood outcomes, switching to our um, uh, new service delivery models and more inclusive practices. And I love seeing higher early childhood outcomes because I feel like it's gonna give us a much stronger running start at kindergarten. And um, I'm curious to study more, you know, as we see these results through the middle school level, do we sustain those through high school? Does that translate to a better ninth grade experience, 10th grade and 11th and beyond? And ultimately, our students leaving our system prepared to do the next thing. Uh, but there's, um, I'm very proud of all those uh, pieces of evidence that show we're going in the right direction. And I'm excited about, um, like I would be here, the more we can embed some of our equity work in the content and the curricular areas, I just think we'll engage even more students and we'll have even more um, in, um, stronger performance. Um, I'll throw one last one in there uh, just because I think we have time. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we studied, I shared this example earlier today, we studied the fact that we had a big gap with uh, one of our middle schools on performance of our African American males in science. And we identified that and we ended up putting in some support there for uh, a young men of color science cohort. and dramatically closed the gap for about 15 students. It's a small group of students, but it's very targeted and very intentional because we identified in that one grade level that, that we were missing the opportunities there. So it's an example of some real, our data you know, was kind of a blind spot at one point. We thought we were doing really well in science there and we uncovered that and thought we gotta do something different and connect with, with students there. That's one example of a specific effort. I have a follow up um, to that question. Um, you know, you talked, gave really great examples of um, ways that the school really collaborates with each other, whether it's teachers and families. And, but what do you think about collaborating with um, other municipal governments, like local governments, like the Hennepin County, I think about when you talk about mental health and right. some of the work that they're doing and some of their other um, partner agencies, where do you see really the leveraging those relationships and talking more 
um, and sharing more information so you can kind of really have those wraparound students for, or services for some of right. our most vulnerable students and their families. I, I, lo I love where you're going with that. We are, you know, we partner in my current district with the Anoka County um, Family Services Group and we, we uh, apply for and receive grants through the county um, opportunities. I, I do think, uh, my experience has been, I'll, I'll reflect back on a different opportunity. So when I was in North St. Paul Maplewood Oakdale, we worked very closely with Ramsey County around wraparound services for social worker and mental health um, related pieces. and. The data really showed that um, that partnership was worth the investment, and it really made a difference when you can collaborate across. Because some families will access the community resources easier than the district resources. That's just their comfort zone, mm -hmm. and that's a, just a different entry point for support. And and um, I am, you heard it tonight at the, at the public session around homelessness. We have some amazing community partners that want to target um, how to end homelessness, and that's a big, lofty goal, and we, I think we can really make a difference in getting there. The other example I would give is um, our, our community and our business community, you know, our county, our business community, where um, you've heard me talk about giving students exposure to some different career pathways in high school and ex um, helping them figure out what they might be interested in. And I just keep thinking of the student that told me he was so excited about his welding class. He has a welding jacket on. He's meeting with us, excuse me, <clears throat> and he was um, just so excited. He's like, I got people calling me for jobs already and I haven't graduated yet. And the passion and the energy he brought to that, that's what we're all about, giving kids a path and preparing them for it. So I think the community partners, higher ed, we need higher ed's help with uh, developing um, more teachers of color and helping us build some training programs and supports. And you know, if we could couple that with convincing more of our students to go into teaching and education, now we're, now we're getting some traction and how do we support them through that? So we can't do this alone. It's back to that family engagement component. We have businesses want to work with us they want to invest in it. We have parents, amazing parents, that would love to engage with us through their business community. And, and some of those um, partnerships can be, you know, us alone can't, we can't just do it by ourselves. So I think we have to s explore any and all opportunities. And in our businesses tell us the skill sets students need when they leave our system. And we have to develop, continue to develop robust course offerings. And I'm thinking high school right now. Um, all the way down through elementary, and I think more about that because it's a competitive education market. Families are, have lots of choices. They can do lots of different avenues, and so we need to really be able to say we offer a high quality education program with lots of options, and that we show success. Um, we, are, we are continually moving into a arena where we gotta do a, on, just a better job at marketing what we offer, and. Um, really showing our results matter. So yeah. keep thinking of examples the more I talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, last question on our sheet here. How do you get your staff to be emotionally connected to you and the work of the district? What makes you passionate about coming to work every day? Well, you heard a, a little about this earlier. I wanna add to that and maybe just to repeat a little bit of that. It's it's me being vulnerable with them. It's me telling my story. Um, I think you get most out of people when you show that you're human as well, and we're not perfect, but we have each other's back. And being real with, with people and, and honest and supportive and responsive. So I believe that um, the staff that work for me know that they're getting my best self and I'm being honest with them and I'm being real with them. And um, the way I've gotten, that's just how I lead. I'm a relational person, I'm, I'm a con you know, connector and I think you do that through personal interaction. And you heard me talk about being out there and being visible, and personal connections and, and that's hard in a large system. So you have to be intentional about it and know 
be planful about it and know where to go and spend, be wise with your time because there's lots of things and decisions we got to make. I just can speak from my own experience. I would run through a wall for some of the teachers that were there for me and coaches. And that's because they connected and invested in me. They listened to me. They validated me. They made me feel like I had meaning. And that's what I try to do with staff is to validate and acknowledge and, and, and lift them up and recognize. Recognition's powerful. It's another way. Um, and just show that you're real. Um, and that is challenging work as a superintendent or even an assistant superintendent when you're responsible for a lot of people. So you have to work hard at it. Just like any relationship, you've heard me talk about that before. You have to invest in it daily. It's work. You can't take it for granted. Trust is earned, not given. You know, those are all things I really believe in. So um, I, I believe I am uh, emotionally uh, in, an emotional leader from that way, and I really try hard to connect with people because that, that's how we get the best from our staff because we need our best for students. They deserve our best. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. That finishes up 11 questions. And uh, now the, the final wrap-up. Uh, <laughs> what's your final pitch? So we have a couple minutes. So, uh, you know, one last time. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, I appreciate, again, your time today. I know this is a long process it's the most important thing you'll do and my hope is when you get down to making a decision you feel like you have all the information on the table so that you feel really good at whatever direction you go with this you feel really confident behind it I want to just point out um, I feel like I'm ready for this position I've been preparing for this I've this is my 21st year in education and I've uh, had amazing experiences across small and large districts in, in multiple states with very different dynamics and those experiences have really prepared me well for what I think Osseo needs to tackle moving forward. And there's some amazing things that can happen and I would love to be the leader of, of that work with you because uh, this, is, this is us working together. And um, you've heard me talk about before, I, I was very selective about applying for this position because I believe it matches my core values and where my passion lies and my skill set. Um, I think I'm the right fit here. I think I can build on the great work that's been done and take us to the next level. So um, thank you for giving me time to you know, tell you more about my work and my passion and what I think I can bring to Osceola Area Schools. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time.